two. Hello and welcome to the RA Group Daily Webcast. Every weekday at 3.30 p.m., we host a daily webcast where our panel of experts discuss a wide range of topics to help you survive and thrive during the lockdown. Um, on Monday, we have some of the country's most renowned chefs speaking with our culinary director, David Sims, on the future of hospitality, the fine and casual dining special. You don't want to miss this one. Today, though, we have Stuart, the head brewer from Toast Ale, and he'll be taking us through everything beer. So please do send through your beer or toast related questions. Now over to you, Stuart. Thanks ever so much, Stephanie. And uh, yeah, happy Friday to everybody. It's, it's a perfect day out there. Hopefully it's sunny where you are and uh, and you've got a beer in front of you. Um, so today we're going to have a little sort of a chat about um, beers and beers, how they made. We're certainly going to talk about the toast beers. And uh, just before we kick off, just a little bit about toast itself. Um, toast ales is set up with the idea of taking food waste. Uh, in our particular case, bread, although we have done some quite funky little things with crumpets from other companies as well, not, not just bread. But we take take food waste, take bread, which um, as far as RA group is concerned, um, I believe you get a lot of your sandwiches and things from uh, a deli. And when those sandwiches arrive on your catering events, well, they never have crusts on them, do they? There's, there's no crust. Those crusts have come to us and they've been made ultimately into a beer. Um, so that bread... Uh, has starches in it. Uh, we can use that to, to obviously make uh, make the beer and ferment with. But toast's idea is about diverting the food waste. So we take probably, or our aim actually is to take about a million slices of bread from those sandwiches over the course of the next uh, year or so um, and produce that into beers. The, the challenges are, are numerous um, and we can come on to some of those a bit later. But we get about one slice, if you imagine like one slice of bread, about a slice of bread into you know, every one of these, to be honest. Um, and that's it. This particular one is a session IPA. Hopefully you've all got a beer for yourselves and we can uh, we can crack on those in a bit. But before we, we dive into the into the toast beers, uh, I'll just crack mine open. But we're going to have a little chat about what makes a beer. And there's broadly speaking two types of beer in the world. Um, there are lagers and there are broadly speaking ales i mean there's a whole host of different ales but the uh, the beers themselves are differentiated broadly about the fermentation um, characteristics so first kind of beers or maybe the history of brewing i suppose quick history of brewing um beer itself and you'll have to appreciate that some of this is going to be with a big pinch of salt so you believe what you want to hear okay i i personally believe that brewing is fundamentally down to the women in this world. They started it. And it all makes sense now. It all makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've spent I spent some of my time uh, previously brewing beer in Africa. And I, I there, there's some uh, so some folklore around how beer started. But if you can imagine that African plain many, many thousands of years ago, and there was a pot, and in that pot was some ground up um, grains could have been grasses could have been early types of wheat but there was something in there which was being made into a type of a soup um, that soup would have been stirred around mixed up given maybe as a porridge or something the next day that soup's got a little bit funky it's a bit better and people start liking it because what's actually happened is wild yeast has come down fallen into the pots and it started to ferment the grains and the sugars that have been made from that that porridge so we get the first kind of semi-alcoholic porridge leave it for another day, it gets a bit stronger. And the people in charge of that magic pot were presumably the women that were, were making the food there. Um, there's even talk about magic wands with the, the stick, so no one knew quite about yeast, but if you took the stick you stirred the porridge with and put it into the next batch, it transferred the yeast, and then you've got another spontaneous fermentation, and off we go again with, with a brewing beer. And you can follow that all the way through in terms of the culture of brewing, probably right up to 1300s, give or take, when beer, certainly certainly the production of a, of a beer-like liquid in what is now Western Europe um, and parts of the, the Middle East, um, would have been undertaken on a household basis. So the person that was in charge of, of the domestic chores of the house 
was in charge of making the beer and that was a woman and certainly in the UK you may have heard the term an ale wife and that's what it was that was a woman that was not only good at making the beer in terms of her own um, household but she was good enough and people made and came to have visited on the sort of way back home from work went to her because she was particularly good at this um, there was then a huge leap forward uh, until about the industrial revolution when sort of pre-industrial revolution most beer that was being made was probably a bit darker than this one to be honest so somewhere between this kind of beer and a guinness and that's because one of the key ingredients to beer is is barley now these days uh, malted barley which is a, a, a grain of barley that's been taken steeped and partially converted so that the the starches start to turn to sugars that we're going to use later in the brewing process but the, the beer was dark because to dry that barley it was being dried over essentially coal and wood and that smoke affected the, the color on the outside of the uh, of the, of the uh, barley itself when that barley went into the mix the color went into the mix and the beers themselves became, became dark beers the industrial revolution did a couple of things one thing it did was it changed it enabled people to start using uh, an alternative fuel source uh, coke which burns a lot hotter but without smoke and secondly the uh, the tax was a tax on glass at the time and that was removed so all your jugs and things you think the old sort of pewter jugs They've all gone out of fashion because people have got a beer now with a glass in it and they, they can actually see the murky stuff that's being made back then. And brewers thinking, well, we can't carry on like this. They can actually see what we're doing. So the coke uh, element, the fuel, enabled things, enabled the barley to be dried a lot hotter and it was not coloured some more. So we got a very pale barley and that started the very first pale beers, which um, would have been around London uh, in particular at the time. Uh, and then spread through to places like Burton, Burton on Trent and, and elsewhere. Around the same time, there was a wonderful bit of industrial espionage. Um, our brewing colleagues at the time from places in what is now modern day Germany and, uh, and the Czech Republic, um, people whose names such as uh, a guy called Joseph Grohl, uh, very famous if you, if you like, um, if you like your, your Pilsner beers. But they came around and started looking at what was happening in the UK in terms of the, the, the light beers that were being produced. Took a lot of ideas, did a lot of cheating. I'm sure if they had iPhones or smartphones back then, they would have been taking pictures of things. They didn't. They had a lot of notebooks and those are now sort of back in, in various breweries in, in Europe. But they took the ideas of, of the light barley's back and they went and took the beer or sort of the barley technology back to their own breweries and started to produce um, lighter beers. So your typical European style beer, the lager beer, that colour of it, that sort of wonderfully in, sort of light golden uh, colour originated here in the UK. It's not something that was invented there. It was about uh, the, the malting technique in the first place. But then we had two different types of, of beer which were being produced. We had the ales, which were actually, typically speaking, an, an ale is actually a beer without hops. Um, so beer only began in terms of the brewing technique, the uh, use of hops came in around 1500, something like that. Um, but before that, everything was ale. So it could have had barley and maybe nettles or herbs or something, but it was an ale. But these days we just use ale to be any kind of I suppose, uh, darker beer or typical beer that we might have in this country. And we have lagers. And the, the main difference is, is about the fermentation. So I believe you've all had a little bit about fermentation with, with wines. Um, within beers, we've got two types of yeast. We've got what we call a top fermenting yeast and then a bottom fermenting yeast. Although it's probably more correct to, to consider them as warm and cold fermenting in terms of the temperatures when the actual uh, beer is fermenting. So a warm fermenting yeast will typically be about 18 degrees, maybe 24 degrees when it's fermenting. And the cold fermenting yeast will be a much lower one anywhere between sort of eight maybe 11 12 degrees centigrade uh, and they make the two different beers the cold fermenting or bottom fermenting yeasts tend to be for the lagers and they will produce very crisp clean tasting beers so all you're going to pick up really in a good lager or a pilsner will be something like um, a slight malty flavor if you've got a, a very old style sort of Bavar uh, bohemian sort of old czech beer 
or perhaps that sort of grassy, earthy, noble hop element that you might pick up, but you won't get any yeast flavours coming through, or you shouldn't get any yeast flavours coming through in a, in a nice lager. Whereas the ales, they're, pro they're produced or uh, fermented at a slightly warmer temperature, and the yeast itself in that environment produces wonderful chemicals called esters, and these are the things you can smell when you pick the beer up. And they could be anything from um, sort of fruity flavours, black currants, if you like, Apples is a bad one. If you get apple flavours in your beer, apple aromas, not a good sign. It means something's gone wrong. There's a fault. Blame the brewer. It's not something else. But aside from apples, the kind of nice smells that you want to get in there, the, the, the sort of black currants are good. Um, one of the big exceptions, and possibly be bigger anomalies, are Weiss beers or, or Weissen beers. Um, so these are typically produced Germany, Belgium, those kind of places. So something like uh, a Ho Garden or a Francicana would be a, a vice beer. That is an ale, but it's fermented slightly warmer, and that strange phenolic or banana-y aroma that you get with those beers, that's because of the yeast, because nothing else, just purely because of the yeast. So we have two broad types of beer, fundamentally around the, the hot and the cold fermentations. There's a whole host of things we can talk about uh, in terms of the terroir, I suppose. Wine people talk about the terroir of the wine, where where those grapes are, are, are come from. The same can indeed, be said. Of... <laughs> Steph does indeed talk about that. <laughs> oh, terroir is a great thing. <laughs> well, for, for brewers, we have something very similar, and that's the water. Um, so most of most of the beer that you're drinking, depending on the strength of it, is somewhere between. 96 and maybe 92 percent actually water and wherever you are in the world the, the water characteristics will be slightly different and that will affect the flavor of the beer and how you perceive it so the best beers which are pilsner beer or the best pilsner beers sorry and lagers tend to be made with very soft water so that might be coming from somewhere like the czech republic or maybe um, southern germany where you've got melt water coming down from the alps It's really low in sulfates in the water and it makes a nice balanced, evenly balanced beer. If you have a beer from Burton on Trent up in uh, uh, the Midlands here, there's a lot of sulfur or sulfate in that beer and that will give you an intensely bitter beer and is far more suited to making that sort of the dark and the pale ales that we associate with maybe a typically English cask beer. Um, and then you've got probably one of the most famous brewing centres for dark beers. If you go to Ireland, then the water chemistry in Ireland is almost perfect for the dark beers because dark beers themselves have some strange quirks around the pH in the brewing process um, that lend them to that, that that kind of water profile. So whereas the wine growers have the valley or wherever it came from, brewers have the borehole and that's quite unique to the, to, to the brewing fraternity that wherever that water comes from that will make a certain style of beer. These days however lots of brewers just take the water and they can back in what they need to so they can recreate a pilsner water a stout water whatever else and you can brew a beer in anywhere you, know, you could be in, in in london you could be in the czech republic and you could make a beer of any style in the world because you understand the chemistry of, of how that happens so that's that's kind of our our unique locality um that is absolutely fascinating now stuart we do have mm -hmm. a quick question yeah. from one of our people here, Daniel, do you think that traditional beer types such as ales or bitters will remain but become less prominent within the marketplace with the ever expanding craft market as and the new range of spirits like the boom gin has experienced? OK. My, my view is that there's a, there's a mix. There's, there's an individual mix in the market and there's a demographic mix, I think. So if, if Daniel is, is thinking of the traditional beers, the traditional cast beers in the UK, they do have a place. Um, there's, there's certainly a, a very strong market for them, for the people that like them. Um, tends to be more demographically driven, to be honest, um, with those. Although there is a resurgence in the US of traditional style beers. In fact, the US are actually doing gravity fed beers now because they think it's quite trendy and quirky. So maybe it will turn full circle. Um, the craft beers, yes, they they've certainly taken on a a, a big 
or, or could seem to be a, a bigger market share over the last sort of 10 years. Um, but if you look at overall, the sort of share of completely the, the liquid in beer, it's still dominated globally by lagers. Um, and that's not really changed over the last 20 years. And I probably don't see it changing too much. So 85% probably of, of the global beer is is a lager. It's a Heineken, it's a Stella, it's a Corona, it's a Budweiser, Miller Lite. It's one of those kind of beers. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't a, a very strong place for <clears throat> the novel craft market and, and that traditional beer as well. So I, I don't see it changing too much, but I think the, I think the craft and the traditional market probably have a very local following. Um, he also asked if you were stranded on a desert island um, and had one beer and snack, what beer and snack would you like to accompany your favourite toast beer? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So which beer of the toast beers and which snack would you like to accompany you? Assuming it's a desert island, I'm, I'm kind of hoping it's a little bit warm. Um, <laughs> it, it, it could be, it could be a snowy island. It could be snow, couldn't it? That could be a desert as well. <laughs> Let's assume it's a tropical island, <laughs> uh, in which case I would be going for the pale ale, actually, um, which might be a bit surprising. Most people might think hot and sunny, you'd go for the lager, but I'd go for the pale ale um, because it's got quite a nice little sort of mango-y element to it, the sort of mango passion fruit, which I think would go, you know, I can imagine the hammock and the, and the sunshine there, that would go well. And the snack with that, oh, I suspect it's probably going to have to be, well, coconuts would be quite nice on the tropical island, but it probably wouldn't go with the beer. <laughs> I, I, I'd end up with something like, yeah, a, a good, I'd like to have like a ploughman's lunch. If you could have a, you could have a ploughman's, is that a snack? Like cheese and, and everything? Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go with that. Yeah, that, that's what I would have. Yeah. Oh, what a perfect yeah. snack. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Caroline also says, um, she's written in, I'm a northerner and as a woman sometimes get picked on for drinking beer straight out of the bottle. Does glassware really matter um, and can a specific type of glass improve the beer? So that was, that was Karen, yeah? Okay. Caroline, yes. Caroline, sorry. Um, yes, Caroline, the, the answer is it, it does affect it. We're going to catch on that in a second. Um, so there's a number of, of, of glasses you can have. So you can see the one I've got sort of here. Um, not quite a tulip, but it's sort of an, uh, an elongated tulip um, glass. If you um, if you think of the, the different types of beer that you can have, so you can get a mug, something like, uh, something like one of these glasses. That's very good for, for IPAs, um, black and brown porters. It's got a very wide uh, top to the, to the glass and the aromas can come out. Um, Goblets, the sort of very round ones that you see, particularly for Belgian beers, they're wonderful for holding the aromas in. So there's a lot of complex aromas. Once you pour the beer into the glass, you start releasing that, that aromatic. So yes, there, there is elements there that's very important for, for the flavour appreciation. Um, drinking straight out of the bottle, um, nothing wrong with it if you're in the barbecue, I guess, or doing something like that. But the problem with that is that you're never going to get the full aromatic element of the brewer itself because you, you, you've not got your nose into it. You, you can't get it quite in there and, and experience that. Um, so it's very much like a tasting a wine or anything yeah. along mm. those lines. Very, very much so. And the the other thing, if, if you ever get, well, one, one thing you, you probably would miss, if you get a, a beer and you, you swirl it, if you ever, ever dip your finger into the top and just get the foam, or just taste the foam, that will give you a much more intense flavour experience about what's gone into that beer in terms of the hops and everything else. And you can't do that with a bottle. Well, I suppose at the very top you could do, but you know, it's, it's not as easy to do. That is very cool. I'm going to try that. <laughs> I've never seen that. Definitely trying it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's worth doing. It's definitely, definitely worth doing. Um, we, we do have a question about Eastern European wine, uh, Eastern European beers, sorry. Um, <laughs> So G Girl um, has written in and said, I find it very strange that lager anywhere in Eastern Europe is a lot stronger than lager in the UK, even though the percentage is the same. Could there be any hidden reason um, as to that she's not aware of? 
Yeah, so there could be a perception, a taste perception on this one. So okay. if we're talking of Eastern European lagers, um, so th these would have fallen into the, in brewing terms, what was the old Bohemian um, part of the world. So we're talking now, what is the Czech Republic, Poland, parts of East Germany, those, those kind of areas. Um, they tend to have quite a, a strong multi profile to them. The, the, the malt comes through very, very strongly. So you, you can get elements of sort of toffee uh, into those beers, which you don't see so much if you're drinking a lager from, say, the Netherlands, and certainly not a lager that's brewed in the UK. And that itself can, can tend to, to give the impression of a, of a stronger, more full bodied beer. So although the alcohol content is the same, you, you you do have a uh, uh, an opportunity to have that perception that it, it just has a bigger impact. I think um, there are, of course, some other issues which are more to do with um, brewing itself and an HMRC. So brewers in this country are allowed to have a, a degree of variation in their strength. So where it says five percent on a bottle of beer, it might not be five percent. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> um, we've uh, we've got a question from Sean just really quickly um, asking if you've seen um, an impact on sales um, through this whole lockdown process and, and what's happening at the moment, um, because he says his beer intake has definitely increased. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, thanks, Sean, for keeping us in, in work. That's that's one thing. For <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, um, it's if we go back five weeks, maybe there was uh, some uncertainty. Um, and then once when, when the pubs closed and the pubs and the hotels and things closed, there clearly was a massive drop in terms of Beer that was going to the on trade. So that's the, that's the large stuff. That's the kegs, for example, that disappeared. Um, but sales to to retailers, to the, the retailers that Toast deal with, have, have increased dramatically um, over the last three weeks. Um, online sales have have gone up. I don't know because I don't tend to deal with the sales myself too much, but I understand that we've got I think about 350, 375 percent increase in online sales. Wow. Whoa. Um, which and then within the brewing sector as well, there's other initiatives going on. So a lot of brewers have got together and they have now um, the sort of geographical beer searches. So you can put your, you can type your postcode into some of these search engines now. Uh, I'm trying to think of the one. There's a company called one of the hop companies have set one up. But wherever you live in the country, you can type it in and it will show you which breweries locally to you are either able to deliver to you or um, still have a sort of a, a shop open where you can just take cans if you want um, um, with, with social distancing. So I th a lot of brewers have seen it. I think within the packaging side, a lot of packaging companies are about 10%, 15% up on their productions as well. So yeah, it is seriously going high. Okay, um, we, we've got a, a little bit stretch there, but glassware, key as well. I've already poured mine, but there is a knack to pouring a beer. So when you do get your beer or your, your can, Glass at 45, in the beer goes, and then about two thirds of the way up, you would normal that you would normally just put the glass um, vertical, and then it will fill up, and you get the nice head across the top there. Um, temperature as well is quite important. <clears throat> um, so depending on the on the style of beer you've got, you need to be thinking of some some basic considerations. And very simply, the lighter it is, the cooler it should be, and the darker it is with hesitancy about the word, but the warmer it should be. <laughs> um, so warm in my sense, everyone says, oh, beer is, beer is warm, it's not. Warm to me is probably about 12 degrees is the warmest a beer would get to. And at that point, we're talking about some very complex barley wines and things like that. Um, whereas a typical lager down at about three, four degrees centigrade. And the temperature and the carbonation will affect your perception of the beer. So the colder the beer, um, sweet flavours are suppressed and the more highly carbonated the beer, the sweet flavours are suppressed. So if you don't like beer, I would suggest trying this with um, something like Coca-Cola. Take a Coke, get it really, really cold and taste it. And, all, and what you'll get is quite a, a sharp 
relatively sharp flavour, almost a, a bitterness. Leave that same drink out to warm up until it gets to room temperature and all you will taste is sugar. And that's purely a function of carbonation levels and, and temperatures and the same is applied to beer. Um, <clears throat> so you have that sort of, yeah, the, the broad range between the, uh, different styles of beer and the temperatures. There are some exceptions, but you should also start thinking about where you keep your beer. Lots of beers left out on the shelf. Don't do that. It gets light struck. It goes goes off quite quickly. Light is not a good thing for beer. So if you do have beer at home, either in a tin cans, OK, but if you've got it in bottles, do keep it in a cupboard. Otherwise, the flavours start, to, uh, start to, to change and you'll get sort of a skunky aroma to it, a bit like old cardboard. It's not nice. Um, you, you, you were discussing earlier, so sorry to, to mm. cut you off there, but just with faults, you said, you know, that skunky sort of cardboard aroma. And then earlier you said apples is a bad one. Yeah. Um, what other flavour sort of profile should we be wary of within beer that mean different faults? Um, popcorn and butter uh, or two. Um, or butterscotch if you if you if you can kind of blend between the two. So they're, they're typically faults on on lighter beers like lagers. <clears throat> um, you can have sort of nail polish and solvent elements that can come through. Um, that that's particularly nasty. That tends to be on stronger, darker beers. Um, they usually they're usually presenting themselves as some kind of fruity aromatic that you don't think should be there. The only difference to those is <clears throat> sourness in case there's an infection in the beer. Um, again, the exception to that particular style would be if it's deliberately a sour beer, like a lambic beer, for example. OK, we do, right. Um, we do have another question from Daniel um, mm. about home brewing, if you could yeah. um, pick that up quickly for us. Yeah. So um, is this relatively easy to do? Um, it doesn't take a lot of money, time, effort. Um, and, and can you actually get a decent product at the end of it? Uh, yeah, if you're starting it, you might end up like me, though. I did my first homebrew when I was about 15 years old. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, th th there's there's a number of ways of approaching it, and the answer is going to be as long as a piece of string to, to do the truth. Yeah. So you can, at a very basic level, you can go and buy a, these tins of extract from a, from a shop. Um, that's just malt extract. The, the very cheap ones tend to be malt and sugar. I would avoid using those because we don't particularly want cane sugar and stuff in our beer if we can avoid it. Um, but a reasonably priced malt extract beer, you put it onto your stove, you heat it up and off you go and you ferment it and you, you will get you will get an alcoholic beverage. Yes, um, whether it's a beer that you like, <laughs> you're stuck because you, you can't change what's in the tin, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, Moving on from that and, so, and that, and to set that up, you could probably get going for 15, 20 pounds, to be honest. With wow. A few, so wow. It's, it's not much. Um, but cl cleanliness and stability will be the key. key yeah. for that. Mm. You can then move on to adapting things like cool boxes and making grain mashes and, and so on and, and hops. All of these things are fine. Probably for 100 pounds, you could probably get away with you know a reasonable setup for this. Um, and then, yeah, where do you go from there? I, I know people that have spent some thousands on, on homebrew, which is, wow. to be honest, I'm not quite sure why you would do that. It's, uh, <laughs> I think, I think there's hobby levels and hobby levels, but yeah, it's it, it's relatively cheap to get into, but I would suggest if you want to have flexibility and the ability to make flavours, you've got to look for uh, grain brewing and you've got to look for your own hop additions rather than the extract kits. And you could probably start that up with some adaptation of kitchen equipment. Um, in fact, if you've got stale bread going around, you know, you, you put that into the beer as well. You know, it's as much what we do. Um, you know, it's it's in there. You, you can ferment with that. It's all all good. There's there's any number of things you can use. So yeah, go go for it. Try it. There's, there's plenty of online sites to do this. Um, Perfect. We're, we're very nearly out of time, but there are just two last questions I would like to get through. First yep. one is from Carolyn. Is, is toast vegan? It is. Yes, it is indeed. Um, so vegan beers or, or the, the issues within brewing are usually to do with clarification agents. Um, so the filtration process for ours is essentially a, a physical barrier. Um, so a bit like very large versions of the cartridges you see under people's sinks for sort of water scent you know is that but imagine that on an industrial scale we use that there's nothing going in there that's that's not vegan approved 
Oh, fantastic. And then just very quickly, what do you think about non-alcoholic beers and have you ever thought about creating any? I think there's a very strong argument for a non-alcoholic beverage beer. Um, I use the word beverage because beer should, in my mind, be a fermented drink. Um, so if you take the beer and then you remove the alcohol from it, fine, I think that's OK. I'm not particularly a fan of some of the beer or some of these things that present themselves as non-alcoholic beers, but they've never been through a fermentation process because I think you lose some character from the, the process as well. But yeah, they, they are, there's definitely a place for them in the market. Um, we have discussed it at Toast. We haven't got round to, to actually having one at this stage of, of our of our life. Um, I think our first option would probably be a lower ABV, maybe like a one and a half or two percent to start with, um, because we don't want to go through the. If, if we make a beer, we want to try and we want a fermented product that has the, the bread in there in the first place. That's, that's what we're about. Um, to make a zero from just blending some frankly some chemicals wouldn't be what we're about so we'll, we'll go go lower to start with and then maybe we get to zero afterwards fantastic well thank you so much Stuart for a fascinating insight into the world of beer and everything you do over at toast ale we do hope you will join us on monday for a live panel discussion hosted by ra group's managing director alice around oh no actually apologies um, that is, the hosting will be done by the culinary director, um, David Sims, on the future of hospitality and um, the future of casual and fine dining. For more information about our programme of discussions, please go to RA Group's website at www.ragroup.co.uk forward slash news to download the broadcast links. Meanwhile, if you have any questions or suggestions about how you can get involved, email gavin.goody at ragroup.co.uk. Otherwise, thank you for joining us today. Have a fantastic weekend. And that is how beer is made. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>